Uh, just to remind everyone that we have the banquet tonight. So our second and last speaker this afternoon is uh, Eckhart Meinhanke, uh, who's a local. He started his uh, biological passport double in alcohol. Well, let me thank uh, the organizers for starters. Uh, so this has been the first in-person conference at Pierce Institute for two years, I've, I've been told. So it's, it's quite special. Thanks also uh, to the audience for coming to my talk. And that includes the Zoom audience. <laughs> right. Yes, yeah, uh, also great honor to speak on this special day dedicated to Kirill McKenzie. Who has of course done a lot of work on double Lie algebroids, and you'll see in a moment how it actually closely relaxes, close, closely connects to his work. So my talk is based on joint work with my former student Jeff Pike, and it's already published in IMRN last year. So to uh, get started, I, I, I want to give a bit of motivation. So so how come I, I started working on, on on these things together with Jeff? So the motivation for me uh, came from Vaness theory, and more specifically Vaness theory for Lie groupoids. So if you're given a Lie groupoid, so I'm going to indicate it by a manifold with these double arrows. If you're given a Lie groupoid, then there's an associated Lie algebroid, as we know. There's the Lie functor, and I'm using this notation that's becoming increasingly popular to just shrink these two arrows to a double arrow. So whenever there's a Lie algebra in the picture, I use this double arrow. Right, and they're corresponding. Yeah, so uh, target and source for the groupoid together make the groupoid anchor map. And once they t come together infinitesimally close, this is, so to speak, the anchor map. Well, of course, the anchor map goes to TM, but, but you get the idea. Mm -hmm. Right. And for groupoids, Lie algebraids, there's a corresponding um, cohomology theory. There's Lie groupoid code chains and Lie algebraid code chains. And long time ago, uh, Alan Weinstein and Ping Shu, I think this was 1991, the paper, unbelievably. Uh, they wrote down a code chain map from the groupoid code chain complex, which is smooth functions on BG. So BG are these composable arrows in the groupoid to the Lie algebra complex, which is given by sections of wedge of A star. So we, we're not going to talk much about groupoids here, so I, I don't want to get into detail what exactly this is. But there is some co-chain complex associated groupoids, and there's a co-chain complex associated to Lie algebraids, and then there's the Vaness map, which they constructed in their paper, which is yeah the co-chain map. And then in low degrees, it's often an isomorphism, and so on and so forth. So there's interesting theory to go with it. There's a bit of an integration map also. Very interesting. So it generalizes the classical Vaness map that one had for Lie groups. And there's a generalization of this uh, due to Abad Krainich. And I should also mention Raj Mehta, um, where instead of smooth functions, you look at differential forms on the groupoid or on this BG. So there's also some omega of BG, Van S map, going to um, what they call a veil algebra. So if our uh, group point is actually a group, 
then this veil algebra is actually the classical veil algebra, so, you know, symmetric algebra of G dual tensor wedge of G star, just this good old friend. But for Lie algebra, it's, well, at least in the about Kleinish paper, the definition of this veil algebra is much more complicated. And so we kind of wanted to understand it better. Uh, actually, in, in Raj's paper, the definition is quite simple. Um, so as you know, there's the super ge geometry interpretation of uh, this complex to Weintraub as uh, smooth functions on A1, so with the degree shift. And according to Raj, this is just C infinity of the tangent bundle where you shift both, I mean, there are two vector bundle directions and you shift both of them by one. And that's the one way of describing the veil algebra. But it's, it's a super geometric description. And so if you're more classically inclined, you want the classical description. And I, we were not quite satisfied with, the, with this about Kreinish description of the veil algebra. And so this is double the algebra. From here, you see the double algebra. Yes, yes, it is a double algebraic, yeah. Okay, so, the that the mm -hmm. so um, I, I actually gave a talk about this at Fields Institute in 2013 in this very room. And um, right be before my talk, Kirill McKenzie was speaking, and this was the first time I met Kirill McKenzie. And so this, this I've prepared here in the hidden blackboard. So he gave a talk about multiple differentiation processes in differential geometry, which was mostly about double Lie algebraids. So that's how I got introduced to the theory. And if you're interested, you can still find the slides on the Fields Institute website of, of this talk. My talk also, but never mind. <laughs> Right, so, so it was a really beautiful talk, I must say. I, I enjoyed it a lot. And I uh, discussed with uh, Kirill after our talks uh, because I've, I felt like the description we had, so, so we meaning, uh, I had some work on, on this with uh, David Lee Bland. Uh, the description we had of, of, of these maps, we were still not quite satisfied of, of how it goes. Um, Mostly my, my complaint was uh, that in, in a way one shouldn't even be thinking about just differential forms on BG. So once you go into the world of group points, you should think of uh, directly, yeah, as uh, Ted was saying, the, the tangent bundle of, of the Lie algebra as a double Lie algebra. And so th this would be then uh, what they call an LA group point. So, so the tangent bundle of the group, but that's what we're talking about. And so we should be able to write something like this actually for double groupoids, double Lie algebraids, that should be the right setting. And so the question was how to define the veil algebra of a double Lie uh, algebraid. And that of course was already answered in uh, Kirill's talk. <laughs> and he explained this due to Ted Voronov. <laughs> so uh, veil algebra for a general double Lie algebraid. These are, I will say a bit further down what, what that actually is. So some double vector bundle. This is some example. And in general, what the veil algebra is, it's just the same thing. So the, the fact that this is the same thing is not a trivial theorem at all. So it's, it's, it's a kind of hard theorem because it's hard. I mean, this description, of course, is, is easy. And I should say it's equivalent so double Lie algebra is equivalent to this um, algebra with two commuting differentials. And the fact that the two descriptions are equivalent, that's a hard theorem. It's, it's hard because mostly the definition of double Lie algebra is kind of hard. Right, so, so we kind of know already what the veil algebra should be for general double Lie algebra, and so we could get started. But on the other hand, uh, <laughs> I'm more classically inclined, so I wanted to have a description a bit more like this. So I wanted to have a classical description of this double complex, which of course, in, in some sense, was given by, by Kreinisch in this special case, and, but kind of complicated. And, and so, so we want to have an easy description of this 
double complex. And so this is basically what I'm going to talk about. So this is what we figured out in this work with Jeff Pike. Any questions so far? Yeah. Um, can you regard the left hand side as like? Can you regard the left hand side as like um, smooth functions on like a the T one shifted G regarded as a groupoid object in the algebraids? Uh, this one. Yes. Yeah, I guess you could say this is uh, like C infinity BT shift one G. Yeah, yeah, that, that you could uh, certainly say that, that, that should be right. Huh? But hmm? mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. I didn't know if that would be helpful at all. Mm -hmm. go from that. <laughs> yeah, I should, I should say, <laughs> of course, then we had this goal of um, developing the theory for double Lie group points and so on. And somehow this goal uh, we never got to. So I, I still need some student to work on, 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 on that part. But we, because it turns out that the theory of this veil algebra for double D algebra is so rich that this already gave a big thesis and, and so lots of things to say. Okay, so for purposes of getting us started, I should first talk about um, yeah, double D algebra. And so first I should talk about double vector bundles. So quick background information about double vector bundles. Of course, Kirill's work is very much about double structures, and you can find all these things in his book, but in his papers. But let's anyhow give a quick review. So let's start talking about double vector bundles. Well, the definition of double vector bundle has gone through several iterations. I think it was originally defined by Friday Ness, and then Material reinterpreted definition as saying, um, well, double vector bundle is a manifold with two vector bundle structures such that, um, okay, if you look at it as a vector bundle vertically, the horizontal map is a vector bundle morphism. And well, this then implies the other one and vice versa. If you spell this out in terms of what it means and in terms of multiplication and addition, uh, it's a long list of compatibility condition. I think nine conditions you end up with. And it's, it's explained in this book. So it looks kind of scary and complicated. Uh, more recently, um, well, I mean, this is already probably almost 10 years ago by now, uh, Grabowski and Rokievich um, realized that actually this whole list can be uh, watered down to just one condition. Namely, uh, it's two vector bundle structures, two vector bundle structures, such that the scalar multiplications commute. That's, that's really all you need. So it's, it's actually an easy fact that a vector bundle structure is uniquely determined by a scalar multiplication. If you know the scalar multiplication, then you know the addition. that if you have a bi-graded manifold to the condition with the uh well uh coordinates uh we have coordinates of weight uh, one zero and coordinates of weight zero one and this automatically uh reconstructs uh, the whole picture okay yeah and, and uh, or, or it gives a, a local description in terms of so it is a fiber bundle it's anyway d is a fiber bundle over m but with a uh, transformation of a special kind and this special kind is dictated by gradients yeah that's this is so there are various ways to, to think about it but um in any case so it's, it's really an easy fact that uh, which i can explain later if you if you wish vector bundle structures are uniquely determined by their scalar multiplications and so here, you just need to assume that the scalar multiplications commute. And if you have that, then for one thing, A and B themselves become vector bundles. I'm not going to write that down. So that, that's automatic. So then, then you have a bunch of vector bundles in the picture already. So let's first give some examples. So the first example is if our double vector bundle is composed of three vector bundles. So you're supposed to have three vector bundles, A, B, and C. 
and you form the final product. Actually, if, uh, for the third vector bundle, uh, I'm, I was going to take the dual for reasons that become clear in a moment. So if you have three uh, such vector bundles, A, B, and C dual, then this becomes a double vector bundle in a natural way. You, you, you have the natural maps to A, you have natural map to B, and you can view this as vector bundle maps. So you can view these as vector bundles in an obvious way. So this is a simple example of a double vector bundle. It's a very important example because one can show that actually every double vector bundle is isomorphic to this example, but non-canonically. But it's also local Yeah. It's isomorphic to this. Non-canonically. So the choice of such an isomorphism is called a splitting. Right, I should say, uh, how does this C pop up in a general double vector bundle? Well, it's actually quite simple. You have this map. Uh, you have the map which goes from um, D to the fiber product. So if I just take the fiber product of A and B, that's also a double vector bundle. And these two maps, uh, no, I, I want uh, a star. Hmm? Wow. So, so, so this is the, the core of the double vector bundle. And my definition for C is that uh, C star. Hmm? And, and by kernel, I, I mean everything that maps into M. Hmm? So it's, it's the inverse image of M. So what? maps under both of these maps to m that's that's uh, this c star so there's always this third vector bundle also in the picture there's a there's b and then there's this core vector bundle and yeah so every double vector bundle is non-canonically isomorphic to just this fiber product so that's the first thing um okay Next example, which is not so well known. Um, if you have a manifold Q and you have two submanifolds, M1 and M2, with gene intersection. So M1 intersect M2, let's call it M, is a clean intersection. Mean intersection means, first of all, the intersection is a manifold and the tangent bundle of the intersection is the intersection of the tangent bundles. So it basically means locally, it looks like the intersection of two subspaces, but not necessarily transverse, that's, that's the thing. So in this case, there is a double normal bundle, which we denote like this, which is, double vector bundle. Uh, on this side, we take the normal bundle of, it's wrong here, M1 relative to the intersection. And here you take the normal bundle of M2 relative to the intersection and then both map to M. Yes, a double vector bundle like that. So that's a nat very natural way of how double vector bundles can show up. And in this case, the core vector bundle is trivial exactly if the intersection is transverse. Right, and the most important example maybe, is the tangent bundle of a vector bundle. That is a double vector bundle. So it's a vector bundle in two ways. So we have these th three examples, so there are going to be some more. Um, yeah, so, so one, one way of, of uh, saying, uh, the most primitive way of saying what it is, is, is you just take 
an iterated normal bundle. So you take the, the uh, normal bundle of uh, Q relative to M1, and it has a submanifold, which is the normal bundle of M2 relative to the intersection. And then you take the normal bundle again. That's one way of, of saying it. But you can also say it more coordinate free in a more sym symmetric way. And, and I, I, I don't think I should do this right now. So there, there's some there's this algebraic definition uh, description of, of normal bundles in terms of vanishing ideas and so on. So if you use this algebraic description, then then it's kind of clear how to do it. No, 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 no. It's 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 much. It's it's, it's more sophisticated. You want to say it algebraically fast? Okay, I can say it uh, algebraically fast. So so the algebra of smooth functions on Q. Has a bi grade has a bi filtration has a bi filtration uh, given by the order of vanishing on these two submanifolds, and then you take the associated bi graded algebra, and that's the algebra of bi polynomial functions on this double vector bundle. So you kind of take spec. That's very quickly. Okay. Yeah. The core is TQ restricted to M mod TM1 plus TM2. That's, that's the core. Mm -hmm. So that's zero if, exactly if the intersection is transverse. Right. So uh, some basic properties of double vector bundles. Mm -hmm. Basic properties. Oh, just leave this one. So, among the basic properties, is the first one is triality. So, if you have a double vector bundle, uh, well, they, they always come in threes. If you have this double vector bundle, then there's another one which goes like, like this. And this is the reason why I use C star for the core, because now you have a C appearing here, not a dual thing. And then there's another one. So you basically do cyclic permutations. No, this one's not A. So here the, the core would be C star, here the core is A star, and here the core is B star. Kind of cycles around. And these come, what's that? And uh, yeah, so roughly speaking, they're dual bundles. So if you take, uh, for example, if you view D as a vector bundle over B, you can take its dual bundle, and that's essentially what this D prime is. So there, there's some signs popping up and how you do the pairing, and, and one has to be careful there. But essentially, that's what it is. Hmm? So, so these come with duality pairings. For example, as I just said, uh, D and D prime, uh, they, they pair. A result, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, it's a, I mean, the, the, the fact that there are three of, of them, or, yeah, the, the th basically discussion of, of the group of these duality transformations is much discussed in Kirill's work, yeah. That's right. So this is one thing. And another thing that I'm going to need is the so-called fat bundles. So I think this name comes from a paper of Alfonso Braciazas and Raj Mehta. Um, 
so for each of these a b c there's some extension uh, so the, so the way it goes is um, you just just give an example of, so the c hat has an extension c has an extension by a bundle which i call c hat and it's extension by a star tensor b star What's that? Star is, Star is just a usual dual bundle, yeah. Over, over M, yeah. So this, this is an exact sequence of just vector bundles over M. All three are vector bundles over M. And what is the C hat? Um, you, you can say uh, in terms of the sections of C hat, these are the smooth functions on D, which are linear in both directions, kind of double linear functions. And yeah, you can maybe imagine a little bit how this goes. So you have double linear functions on D, linear in both directions. You can restrict them to the core and then they become linear functions. So that's how this quotient map goes. If you have a double linear function on D and you restrict to the core, it just becomes a linear function on the core. And, and so hence we have this quotient map because the core is C, C dual. And here, well, if you have a linear function, so a section of A star, I can view it as, as a linear function on A. So if you have a linear function on A and a linear function on B, I pull back under the two maps, I multiply together, I get a double linear function. So that's that's this map. Right, but then, then uh, you have the same thing also for A hat and B hat. Uh, so for each of them, you have these extensions and the exact sequence. It's known that the exact sequence actually determines the double vector bundle. This is uh, work of Chen Liu Sheng. B sequences. Again, uh, so th this, this exact sequence itself is in the paper of uh, Gracia, Zas, and Mehta, but, but their work says that these exact sequences can be used to reconstruct what the double vector bundle is. And yeah, as another remark, uh, the splitting of this exact sequence is equivalent to a splitting of the DVB. So this decomposition to A plus B is in C star, that, that's equivalent. Okay, let, let me explain uh, what this means in terms of the example, in terms of this example. So here we have A equals V, um, or maybe I should have put the A over here. Right? So the A is V, the B is, Tm and the C star is V, so C is V star. And then we have three double vector bundles obtained by cyclic permutation. So the next one would go like Tm V star M. And then we have V star V M. And what are these? Uh, so this is essentially T of V star. And this one is essentially T star of E, which according to Mackenzie Shu is also T star V star. I'm saying essentially because there's always this issue with signs. You have to be a little bit careful. And what they're these hat bundles. So each of them has some extension. So there's a C hat, some extension of V star by TM tensor V, you know, what is a T star, ten, T star M tensor V star. It's the jet bundle. Uh, here we get also a jet bundle. And here we get an extension of TM. Uh, well, it's the TR algebraid. 
of the vector bundle. So this vector bundle, so this, this Lie algebra whose uh, sections are the infinitesimal automorphisms of the vector bundle. Okay, so all very nice. And, and yeah, so, so going back to this point, a splitting of this exact sequence is equivalent to a splitting of, of the double vector bundle. So splitting of any of these, splitting of uh, this jet bundle or splitting of the ITR algebra is equivalent to a splitting of this, any of these three double vector bundles. And all of these things are equivalent to having a connection. So six ways of characterizing what a connection is. Spl a linear connection on V. It's an ordinary linear connection. Right? I mean, as well known, splitting of a tier algebra, everybody knows it's a connection on the vector bundle. And somewhat amusingly, splitting of the jet bundle is also a connection. And so this is not a coincidence. It's, it's just all, all the same story in a way. Right. And now I, I want to define what is the Weyl algebra. Okay, so, so what is the kind of classical description of uh, uh, yeah, this, this Ted Voronov uh, thing, this C infinity of D11. So for, for starters, we don't even have any D algebra structures in the picture. I, I just want to have it as a bi-graded algebra. And so what is it? So the Weyl algebra. DDB. Okay, I can just define it. So we define our veil algebra as the bigraded algebra. Um, which is generated by Okay, I just have to say what is low degrees. It's generated by its things in low degrees. Uh, W00, zero zero, it's just smooth functions. Then we have W10, that's going to be sections of A star. And we have W01, that's going to be sections of B star. And then there's W11. Uh, that's going to be uh, the sections of the C hat. So those are, are the generators. And then there are relations. And the relations uh, is motivated by this exact sequence. So if, if I denote this map by I, this inclusion of A star tensor B star into C hat, then uh, yeah, you kind of expect probably that if you have a section of A star and a section of B star, and you tensor them together and map them, so this would then be a section of, of the C hat. This should be the same thing as just multiplying alpha and beta in the algebra. And that's that's all there is. But you don't have the algebraic structures No, no, at the moment, no the algebraic structures. Just for any double vector bundle, we have this bigraded algebra. But you don't also have differentials. Yeah, th this is still coming. Hmm? Yeah, that comes later. Okay, so it is oh didn't i say yeah it's com commutative by graded algebra and and so, i mean commutative means super right that's right yeah and the simplest example If the, uh, 
is our double vector bundle is just split. Then, um, so this is our double vector bundle. Then uh, the description becomes quite simple, and, and you find that the corresponding veil algebra is going to be sections of wedge of A star, tensor wedge of B star, tensor symmetric algebra over C. Because of the triality. Uh, business. Otherwise, I would have stars all over the place. What's that? So, so, so th th this is what the veil algebra is as a. Oh, the, the veil algebra. Sorry. Yeah, of, of D. Thank you. Hmm? So, so, so where these are, are the generators in bi degree one, zero, zero, one, and these have one, one. Which means symmetric. Yeah, this means symmetric. That's symmetric algebra. It's smaller. It's a symmetric algebra. Yes. Yeah, so, so the, the the relation was um, there, right? This one, and uh, if it's split, then then you can use the relation basically to get from the C hat to just C. This is the definition. Yeah, this is the whole definition. No, here we don't. Oh, you could say um, you could say that uh, the D can always be lifted to uh, some kind of bigger double vector bundle where there is a canonical splitting, and then you take a quotient. There's a way of doing it like that. That's why we have a kind of quotient procedure here. Mm -hmm. Okay, but but so this is basically the the picture once you choose a splitting, and so it's similar to the usual veil algebra already. Um, another example is if uh, if you look at the veil algebra of a tangent bundle. Okay, so this would be generated by by sections of V star. So, so because A is V, so sections of V star, uh, it's generated by sections of B star, which is one forms. One forms. And then it's, uh, we also have sections of uh, C hat, uh, which is jets. Well, no, not, not all sections are, are, are jets, but uh, okay, you know what I mean. So these, these are sections of that bundle. And then if you look at what the relation is, um, so the relation ends up being a one of, if you multiply tau by a function minus f times j1 of tau, uh, that's the product, tau times df, product in the algebra. Which definition? It's for, for any double vector bundle, you automatically have this sort of exact sequence. Yes, but you forget something. I mean, exact sequence doesn't, you can, can you recover from exact sequence? A yeah. Double vector bundle? yeah, this is their paper. So, so if you know the exact so what, sequence. What do, what do you need to add more? We just have a set sequence, some extension of C by A star B sequence. That's the intention. So this is entirely in full the structure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it does. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you okay. 
You can also think of them as, as those exact sequences, but it means it's a bit less symmetrical maybe, but no, it's, it's basically the same. Yeah, you can. Uh, yes, these, these two would anti-commute because they have yeah. one, one zero and zero one. This is by degree one one, so it commutes yet. This is even. Mm -hmm. So so here I have to be careful to with the order. That's why I'm clinging to my notes. All right. Uh, so what about the properties of this uh, double vector bundle? Mm, this I still need. I'll continue here. If before I go to introduce some Lie algebraic structures. So the uh, main properties that I should mention is first of all, there's the triality again, right? Because we have with, with every double vector bundle, we actually have three double vector bundles. And so we also have three veil algebras. And they talk to each other a little bit. So, so there, there are some pairings between them. For example, um, there's a pairing WP1 of D prime prime times W one Q of D prime goes to sections of wedge of P plus Q minus one C star. There, there's some pairing like, like this, which, um, okay, look, looks kind of mysterious if, if you just write it like this, but if you're, for example, in this special case and you uh, just, write it out in, in the special case you, you you see that there's kind of very natural thing to to pair it's some 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 contractions and these these pairings are interesting because uh, these particular spaces they have special interpretations i mean wp0 uh, has a very simple interpretation that that's just wedge of a star or something like that but this p1 also has some interesting interpretation namely if you think about it, this gets interpreted as linear uh, sections of wedge of D, if you view D as a vector bundle over A. So maybe to make it very clear, like, like this. You think of D as a vector bundle over A, so and then you take wedge of it. And so you look at this exterior bundle but then you have the other vector bundle structure as well. So you have the corresponding scalar multiplication and you can look at sections that are linear with respect to that. And this is the meaning of this space. Whereas this space here gets identified with, if you think of it as a vector bundle over B. And take sections. So there's this funny pairing for any double vector bundle. Something like this also appears in, in Kirill's work already. He calls it uh, a warp pairing. I can see. I mean, it's a bit more general than what he does, but yeah, his construction is a special case. Of, the warp pairing is a special case of this. Yeah, and so, so, so this also turns out to be interesting. So, so there's lots of interesting um, stuff going on. I forget how much time do I have? 15 minutes? Okay. Right, so, so now I should finally um, say what happens if you turn on some Lie algebraic structure. And that's why I was adamant of keeping that blackboard because I want to now turn on a Lie algebraic structure. Oh. I don't need any more, but... So let's suppose that in addition to just being double vector bundles, 
D is a Lie algebra over A. And it's a, actually a VB algebra, which means yeah, that this Lie algebra structure is invariant under the horizontal scalar multiplication. So if you have this, and again, this is of course much discussed in Curious work. Um, if you have this VB algebra structure vertically, then as we know, if you take the dual of a, a Lie algebra, it has a Poisson structure, a linear Poisson structure. So the dual in this direction is over here. And so here we have a Poisson structure on this D prime prime. So I'm, I'm just gonna indicate it like this to remind us that there's a Poisson structure in the picture. But it's not just a Poisson structure um, kind of for this vector bundle, because there's the other scalar multiplication as well. And it's invariant under that. So it's kind of a double linear Poisson structure. It's not just a linear Poisson structure, it's a double linear Poisson structure. And then you can apply kind of duality again. And then you see that actually uh, this one is also a Lie algebra. It's a VB algebra. So you have all these structures in the, in, in the same time. And the theorem, which probably at this stage is kind of unsurprising, is that these Lie algebra structures are encoded in differentials on our by grade algebra. Theorem, not entirely due to us, uh, that vertical uh, B algebra structure on this D is equivalent to having a horizontal on this D prime and it's equivalent to having a double linear double linear uh, Poisson structure on D prime prime, so until here it's, it's all Mackensky. And it's also equivalent to having a vertical differential on the veil algebra corresponding to D. So let me just indicate it like this, D vertical. So by degree uh, one zero, I suppose. It's um, so, so. So we have these, these two. It's, it's bigraded, right? So, so we have these two directions, mm -hmm. and it's a differential for one of them. The one, zero. One, one zero, yeah. Mm -hmm. One zero zero one. I'm, I'm getting confused, but but in any case, so or it's equivalent to having a horizontal differential on the G prime, or it's equivalent to having a Gerson Haber bracket. Um, of by degree negative one, negative one on this one. Yeah, you can kind of imagine that this Poisson bracket here gives rise to some bracket on the corresponding Veil algebra, and there's some some Gerson Haber bracket. So all these these ways of understanding it. All right. Um, yeah, for example, we can look at this example. What was that? The the, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's just. That's what it is. There's no T, there's no T here. No, this is a double vector bundle already. D is a double vector bundle, so I don't have to take a T. No, so. Oh yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Can you interpret the structure on that state of Yeah, so, so, so what this definition does is gives a classical description of the same thing. Similar to sections of wedge of A star. Okay, I, I want to illustrate this with this example. 
um, because here, of course, we have um, we have the algebra structures. Or the tangent bundle is in the algebra. That's good. Awesome bracket. And so we get all these structures on the base veil algebras. And so what we get out of this, for example, are for example, we get Yeah, lots of differentials and pairings and so on, but in particular we get a vertical differential acting on W of TV, which I can restrict to something comma one, right? because it, the vertical differential only acts on the first one. And this, but by what I had said earlier, I'm not sure if it's still there are some somewhere so, so these things can be interpreted as as these linear sections so this has an interpretation as linear differential forms on b star yeah, and unsurprisingly it's just a ram differential on that uh, you also have dh on uh, one comma zero of TV star, which are linear differential forms on V. Again, just a Durham differential. But the neat thing is um, you also have a pairing between them. So this is this, this thing. There's also pairing. So it's, I mean, this is kind of boring, but, but then the more interesting, there's a pairing uh, with valued, values in just differential forms. It's a linear form of degree P and a linear form of degree Q and produces on the base a form of degree P plus Q minus one. So that's one thing one has. Uh, another thing one, one gets is a bracket. You also get some, this Gerson have a bracket. I think I always do know with double bracket because there's too many brackets, uh, which I can, um, so it's of by degree one one it, it it restricts for example to this w one i think w dot one of what's the third one t star v right so because here we have the poisson structure and this is then interpreted again in terms of this business as linear multi-vector fields Yeah, and this is just the Schouten bracket, unsurprisingly. And this comes automatically with a natural representation on W dot comma zero, which is um, um, just uh, sections of wedge of V. And, and, and this kind of story was discussed in the work of uh, David Iglesias Ponte, Camille Laurent Jengou, and Ping Shu. It plays a role there. So, sorry, the names are, are too long. Homogeneous of degree one, I think. Uh, no, uh, so, so, so we look at multi vector fields on V, V viewed as a manifold, but then on, on V is a vector bundle, so there's homogeneity, and so it should be homogeneous of degree one. Hmm? No, I think um, for, for, for multi vector fields, actually, means not degree one, but degree. It depends, yes. Yeah, yeah. So some, some shifts there. Mm -hmm. All right. So the coefficients have to be homogeneous of degree one if you express some coordinates. All right. Five minutes still. Okay. Yeah. Then, then, then I should very, very quickly say what happens now if you have a double the algebra. So then, um, oh, sorry, I, I got this wrong. What did I do here? Oh dear, it's all wrong. So if you have a double Lie algebra, then uh, I mean this just remains a vector bundle structure, but then you have a linear Poisson structure here also. And on the other hand, uh, here you're going to have 
uh, Lie algebraic structure. So on, on one of them, you have two Lie algebraic structures. On one of them, you have a Poisson structure and a Lie algebraic structure, and on the third one also. Right, and uh, yeah, I can not have much time, so. That's right. So, so his definition of double uh, E algebra. So, Mackenzie. Yeah, I have to define it after all. This is double E algebra uh, by definition, if and only if this D prime and D prime prime form uh, a Lie by algebra. Which again is a notion, I believe, introduced by McKenzie and Chu. Okay, I don't have time to explain what that is. Oh, so, so, no, so uh, com compatible, compatible. So the question is. Um, so, so the question is, what does one mean by uh, uh, compatible Lie algebra structures? And so here are two Lie algebraids, and that's this notion of, of uh, Lie by algebra, and, and that, that's exactly. Yeah, this is, of course, Ted Voros theorem yeah, okay. that, that it's the same. And it's, it's not obvious. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's what you certainly would expect. <laughs> mm? okay. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so a double Lie algebra. Structure on D. Okay, maybe the, these two uh, conditions I omit is. I mean, there's something here also, of course. But 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 what you then have is uh, it's equivalent to having commuting differentials. On the Weyl algebra. Is equivalent to having compatible um, a compatible horizontal differential and Gerson Haber bracket on the next one is also equivalent to having compatible vertical differential and Gerson Haber bracket on the last one. Right. Yeah, and I'm running kind of short of time so um, i'm not sure what i can say in terms of applications of this so you can, can sort of imagine that uh, with all these structures floating around uh, i mean there are all these duality pairings and differentials and gerson Haber brackets uh, you, you get actually quite a lot of out of it and um, yeah lots of the kind of standard complexes and so on that are associated with lie algebra they just show up very naturally in this context as special cases of something um, yeah, maybe at least one thing I, I, I should mention. Um, so, if you look at uh, just just what what got us all started, the, the Weyl algebra of the tangent bundle of the Lie algebra. So, if A is a Lie algebra, um, we, we saw it, it, it's generated by sections of A star, one jets of sections of A star, and uh, differential forms, you might just say DF. Hmm? It's, it's kind of informal, it's generated by such things. And um, what are the formulas for the horizontal and vertical differential? So the horizontal differential of tau is just, uh, so tau is section of A star, that's just trivially Eilenberg differential. That's a thing of the wedge of A star. Then we have the vertical differential of tau. Uh, that should have degree one, one, and it's just a jet. And then we have the horizontal differential of F. That's just the Dram differential. And then we have the vertical differential of F. That's again Chivalry Eilenberg differential. And yeah, th those are all, all the ones that you need to know. Then you can construct the, I mean, then you can figure out what is the 
so the vertical differential of, of a jet, for example, has to be zero because d squared is equal to zero. And dh of, of this, because dh dv is minus dv dh, you can also figure out. So this about, about Kreinich uh, complex now has a very simple description, just in terms of generators and relations. And we can just say what the differentials are on those things. Yeah. So we, we have many more applications, but I don't think I have any time. So let's just stop here. One remark, so you said that this also exists, but you work in C infinity setup. Oh, so that's if you, if you do it in polymorphic setup, it won't, it won't exist. But these are local models, 